Jim, did you get with them before you spoke and get them to play that? <laughs> Jim turned around and said, am I taking too much time? We need to understand it's not my time. It's God's time. You know, the Bible tells us that with God, a thousand days, just like one day to Him. Folks, we could stay here for two or three hours and God would say, well, they just spent a few seconds there worshiping me. Never spend enough time in God's house worshiping God. Take your Bibles again. Turn back to Haggai chapter 1. Tonight we're going to finish that uh, first chapter. This morning we saw God's call for a spiritual awakening, part 1. Tonight we're going to see God's call for a spiritual awakening, the last half, part 2. Follow along with me as I start reading in verse number 5. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Listen to what he says, church. Consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe ye, but there is none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He repeated himself, didn't he? Must be pretty important. He says, go up to the mountain and bring the wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. Remember we talked this morning about building God's house, and we're not talking about building a building made out of brick or mortar, or wood. We're talking about a building made out of lively stones. That's you and me. He says, go up in the mountain, bring the wood, and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Now, he's talking to them about rebuilding the temple. He's talking to us about building the spiritual house. You look for much, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home... I did blow on it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is in waste, and you run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. Let me stop right there and say something. I want you to notice who that covers. There's Zerubbabel, then there's Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and then... The there is the remnant of the people, the government, the religious people, and all the remnant of God's people, listen to what it says, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai thy prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spoke Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josetek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. Boy, I tell you, when there's a revival, the spirit of God moved, not, in, not just in the people, but in government, and in high spiritual places. And they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Father, thank you for the reading of your word tonight. Father, again, we pray for a spiritual awakening in our nation, spiritual renewal in our own lives, and a spiritual revival among God's churches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After reading all that, let me just say this. 
If Jesus lives in your life, you ought to show it. If Jesus lives in your life, your light ought to be shining. This morning we saw that the Jews had returned to Jerusalem under the leadership of uh, Zerubbabel and also Joshua, and they returned to Jerusalem for one purpose, to rebuild God's house. And to begin with, the people were on fire. Boy, they had zeal. They were enthusiastic. They cleared away the rubble. They began to build a foundation. They laid the, the altar, rebuilt the altar, and, and they began every day doing their daily sacrifices. But then their enthusiasm began to, to fade away, and their zeal began to decline. And, and all of it started when they had problems with the Samaritans. And you remember what the Samaritans did? Out of spite, they went to the, the government officials and they kind of complained and, and, they, and they got the work of God stopped. And the people began, became more and more concerned, not about God, not about God's house, but they more, became more and more concerned about self. They became more and more concerned about their own personal affairs and business. So for the next 14 years, the temple, the house of God, was neglected. And the work on God's house just completely came to a standstill. It just stopped. And we saw this morning that God sent Haggai to kind of shake the people out of their spiritual apathy. And I talked this morning about that spiritual apathy and the causes of spiritual apathy. And Haggai come to wake them up, shake them real good, and to remind them, hey, you all have got some responsibilities to God. I've got some spiritual things that you need to be doing for God. You need to be building His house. And Haggai's message did something that a lot of times God's messenger don't get out of people. It produced a positive response from the people. And because the people responded to God's messenger and God's message in a great way, there was a great spiritual awakening among the people. They changed and moved toward God, and God moved closer to them. Folks, this is one of the two spiritual themes that dominate the message uh, of, of this book of Haggai. The first is spiritual apathy. The other one is a great spiritual awakening. There's spiritual apathy in our country today, and folks, the reason there's spiritual apathy in our country is because there's spiritual apathy in our churches. There's spiritual apathy among God's people. And the second thing in this book is a spiritual awakening. Folks, when God's work is neglected, God sends a message to His people. He gives His people a wake-up call. And you read this and you say, well, preacher, that's good. These people needed a challenge. These people needed to be waked up. Folks, this and this message is not just a challenge for the church in Haggai's day. It's a challenge for Highland Park Baptist Church. Amen. It's a challenge for every church tonight. It's a challenge for everybody who's been born again into the kingdom of God. Part of our responsibility when we were saved, is to become temple builders. And I said this morning, that's not building fancy buildings. That's reaching people for Jesus. It's being a soul winner. And God is challenging His church today, just like He challenged the people back in Haggai's day. He said, and He's challenged people down through the years. He says, build my house. Go out and tell people about Jesus. You go out in your community, then you go out in, 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 into your state, and then you go out into your nation, and then you go out into the uttermost parts of the world and tell people about Jesus. 
And I said this morning, church, it's time for us as a church to get back to the task for which the church exists, and that's building up God's house. That's becoming people that tell people about Jesus. Jim was talking about the love of Jesus. You know, too often all we are is sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. We talk a good talk but we're not going out and, and showing the love of Jesus to people. God's people can no longer be content with being doing business as usual or with the status quo, as I think I mentioned this morning. I said this morning that the people in Haggai's day, and I think I used the expression, they were fat and happy. Somebody come up to me this morning and said, Preacher, a better example, you should have said they were fat and sassy. So that's what I always hear. But the, the main point I'm trying to say is they had become nothing more than couch, uh, uh, couch potatoes in the church, pew setters in the church. They were just content with the way things were. They didn't even have walls around them, didn't have a roof over their head. All they had was a slab of concrete with an altar where they could come and give their daily con uh, sacrifices, and they were perfectly happy with what they had spiritually. Oh, but they went back to their fine houses, called sealed houses or paneled houses or tiled houses. Houses. Somebody, I read a commentator the other day and it said that the people were taking the materials that God had intended to be used to build up his house and they were taking it back and remodeling their houses with it. Folks, listen, the Spirit of God is continually moving us toward holiness. Do you hear that? Every day. God wants us to be more holy than we were the day before. Every day God wants us to be closer to Him than we were the day before. And if you and I ever become content, if we ever stop listening to the Holy Spirit of God and be moved by the Holy Spirit of God, we're not going to grow. We're going to die. I went to a meeting not too long ago, and the meeting was about plateaued churches, churches that weren't growing anymore. And it was put together by the Tennessee Baptist Convention. Johnny Hunt was the speaker. Anybody know Johnny Hunt? Johnny Hunt got up and he said, I want to know who named this seminar. Some guy standing on the front row stood up and said, I did. I put this together. Johnny Hunt said, sit down. <laughs> he said, first of all, there's no such thing as a plateaued church. He said, a church is either growing or a church is dying. Amen. A church doesn't stand still. It's either moving up and growing in the kingdom of God or it's dying. And folks, it's the same for a Christian. If you ever stop moving toward holiness, if you ever stop moving closer to God, if you ever stop listening to the Holy Spirit, people say, well, they're not growing anymore. No, they're just slowly dying every day spiritually. Let me ask you something. Are we content to be in the present rut we find ourselves in church? Are we content with the spiritual condition we find ourselves in individually? Tonight we're going to look at the response of the Jews to Haggai's correction, to God's message to them. And I hear people say sometimes, I'll get through preaching, and they'll say, Preacher, you stepped on my toes today. First of all, I don't step on anybody's toes. I know I'm a big man, but I can't step on anybody's toes from up here. And I know that I'm not the best preacher in the world, but every time I step in this pulpit, I pray one thing. I say, God, may your Holy Spirit use me 
Use the words you've given me and give power to speak to the hearts of the people and may the people listen to the Spirit of God and be obedient to the Spirit of God. And folks, if you feel God stepping on your toes, it's because you've been receptive to the Holy Spirit and you're trying to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. We need God's correction. That's what Second Chronicles says. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and ask for forgiveness, correctness. He says, then I'll forgive you and heal your land. And, and you can be what I want you to be. Folks, this is one of those unique times in the life of a church where people actually listen to God and responded to God as a church together. This is one of those unique times when God's prophet spoke a message to the people and the people heard it and obeyed it and heeded it. And you know what happened? God sent a revival. You know, we pray for a spiritual awakening. We get down on our knees in the altar and pray for a spiritual awakening. And sometimes I think God's saying, well, here it is. I want to give it to you. Just listen to what I'm saying to you so that I can give you a spiritual awakening. You know, the biggest problem in the church, it's me and you. If we'd get out of the way and let God be God, folks, we'd have a spiritual awakening and we'd have a revival. Look in verses 3 and 4 again. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses? And this house lying waste. What are you doing, people? Is what he's saying. Look over here at my church. Well, there's nothing over there but rubble, but look at the houses that you live in. That hurts. Everybody, when you read that, everybody ought to say, ouch. Folks, what you and I invest our time in and our money in shows what's really important in our lives. And more importantly, it shows where God rates in our lives spiritually. You get an idea where God rated on, 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 on their list of priorities by the state of their house or God's house back then. But an important question for us to ask ourselves tonight, church, is this. What's the state of Highland Park Baptist Church spiritually? This is the place that God has charged us with to build, to be lively stones. Let me put it this way. You look around and you say, well, look at our building. Look what we've done in the balcony. Look what we've done over in the educational building. Look at our parking lots. Look at what we're doing while we're investing in God's house. Let me put it another way, folks. When we look at our church budgets, when we look at how we use our time and talent and energies in the church, when we look at how we invest ourselves spiritually in Highland Park Baptist Church, how much of our time, our energy, and our money is actually spent trying to bring lively stones, lost people, into God's house. We spend thousands of dollars in churches all over, millions of dollars all over the United States building physical houses to worship in. But is that money really going into building God's house? And I hear people say, well, you can't reach lost people unless you have a place to bring them into. Folks, we don't ask people to come to church. We don't go outside and, and witness to people like we ought to. 
We all know that the real ecclesia is not a building, it's the people. You and I are the church. We are supposed to be building up God's church. What about the time you and I devote to God? How much of it is actually spent bringing lively, lively stones, lost people, to God's house? You know, we set aside time, or we ought to set aside time for, for, for devotion. We come to church and we worship. Sometimes we might, need even, we might even go to the bookstore and buy a Christian book. Let me ask you, is what we're doing adding people to God's Lamb Book of Life? This is a question God asked in verse number 5. He says, Now saith thus... The Lord of hosts, consider your ways. In other words, you know what he's saying to the people? What have you been up to? What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your money? Consider your ways. What are your priorities? Is your time, your money, your energy, your effort going into building the real church? Or is it going towards just making yourself comfortable? and being content with the status quo. Folks, this is the first thing we need to do if we want to experience a real spiritual awakening in our church and in our lives and in our nation. We need to give special and careful consideration to our priorities, what's important to us. God wants first and foremost for us to be soul winners, to build up His church on earth. And if we get our priorities right, He's the one who's going to be blessed. But the other side of that's true. If you neglect building my house, you know what God says? Well, I'll just neglect you. Look in verse number 6. He said, You sown much, bring in little. You eat, but have enough. Not enough. You drink, but you're fit not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. In other words, you use all your money, all your energy, all, on all these things you think is important to you, but when you look back, what have you really achieved? What have you really got? Now, Dennis Green will know what I'm getting ready to say. My papa clicked, and I don't know a good way to say it, he was a tightwad. He was stingy. And my daddy would always say, he, he would give my mamma quick uh, some money to buy groceries on. And if she ran out of something, he'd say, well, you can't buy anything till next week because we've, we've done spend all we can spend on groceries. You go into his house, there was only one light on in the room. And if you went in another room, cut a light on, when you come out, that light better go off. He was stubborn, I guess is the best way. I preached his funeral, and I used 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I said, that was my papaw click. That means stubborn. And that's what, that's, that's what he's saying here. You use all, all the things on, on things you think is important and you're stubborn because you don't have your eyes on me. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to come up empty and you're going to be unfulfilled. And God says, you know how I know you're going to come up empty and not be fulfilled? God says, I'll make sure of it. My daddy always said to Papa, and I thought this was a good analogy, daddy being at the funeral home, He'd always say to Papa, Papa trying to save his money, he'd always say, Daddy, have you ever seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul it? <laughs> Which Papa didn't think that was funny. <laughs> Folks, we think we're busy. The truth is, we're so busy doing things for ourselves, we don't have time for God. And the truth is, you and I cannot afford not to make time for God. 
to honor Him is the most important thing we can do. We need to give careful thought to how much time we're putting into building up God's kingdom. Verse 7 and 8, God says, Consider your ways, go up to the mountain, bring food, and build a house, and I'll take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. God's not impressed with big, beautiful buildings. He's impressed with what honors Him. He wants us to live our lives in a way that we become a blessing to Him. Amen. That's why I asked you at the beginning, who lives inside you? If it's Jesus, show it. If it's Jesus, tell the world. <clears throat> and as every sinner comes to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what happens? Another stone is added to the spiritual building that God's raising up in this world. And if we want to bring pleasure to God and honor God, what are we going to do to build His house? Verse 9 and 11 says, You looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I did blow on it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because mine house is in waste, and ye run every man into his own house. There's a spiritual law that says, and it really comes from the first great commandment. And the spiritual law says, if you love anything else ahead of me, that thing you love more than me will come to ruin. Now I want you to look at the people's response in verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel and Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest with all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people did fear before the Lord. Folks to have a great spiritual awakening we need to see a positive response to God's correction we need to hear God's message we need to obey it. There needs to be unity in the body. Everybody needs to be on the same page. And you just can't give God lip service. Folks, there has to be real change. We have to obey the voice of God. Haggai's not bringing a popular message. Haggai's not bringing one of these feel-good messages that people want to hear uh, about the, the love of God and the grace of God and about heaven. Haggai is exposing sin. Haggai is exposing sin that's being committed directly against God Himself. And the people heard it, and the people responded to it. But one last thing, the people feared God. Folks, this is one thing that's missing in our nation today. I think it's missing in our churches today. People need to have a genuine reverence, a respect, an awe, a holy fear of God. Amen. Folks, God's not some, somebody that we can mold into to our image. God says, I'm going to mold you into my image. The same God, church, who is known for His love, His mercy, and His forgiveness is the same God that should be known for His holiness, His righteousness, and His justice, and His hatred of sin. And church... We need to have a fear tonight driven by a genuine conviction of sin and an embarrassment of our spiritual condition and the moral condition of our nation and then that ought to lead us to say, God, something needs to be done. And you know what God will say? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray 
and seek my faith and ask for forgiveness. He says, I'll do something about it. I've already made that promise. Folks, if there's real repentance, God will bring about real change. To experience a spiritual awakening is to be responsive to the leading of God's Holy Spirit in my life and your life. Church, it's one thing for us to hear God's Word. But without the working of the Holy Spirit in my heart and in your heart and in my mind and in your mind, there will never be a life-changing change come to any of us or a response on our part. People heard the Word of God from Isaiah and they didn't respond. They heard the Word of God from Jeremiah they didn't respond. They heard the word from Ezekiel. They didn't respond. But here comes Haggai. He guides up. He preaches God's word. The people respond. There's a great spiritual awakening. Why? Because the people responded by the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. Folks, our spiritual attitude toward God is important. The key ingredients to a spiritual awakening... We need to give careful thought to our priorities. We need to have a positive response to God's correction. As you read the Word, as you pray, as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, and then you have to be responsive to the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. God's challenging us, church. He's challenging me. He's challenging us to build His house on the right foundation to tell people about Jesus. And you know in verse 13 what He says to them after this great spiritual awakening, He says, I'm with you. If you're willing to obey Me, I'm with you. If you're willing to obey Me, I'll give you this spiritual awakening. Folks, listen, we need God more than we've ever needed God before in our nation. We need God more than we've ever needed Him before in our church. We need Him more than we've ever needed Him before in our lives. And God's challenged us through Haggai. And folks, it can't be church as usual anymore. We're going to have to build God's house the way God wants His house built. And you know what the Lord's doing right now? He's saying, Church, what's your response going to be? Haggai preached the message and the church responded positively. And God sent a great revival. Church, what's our response going to be? You know, there's a verse that says, I don't know about you, but for me and my house, for me and my house, I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to obey the Lord. Folks, listen. God has spoke to me these past, oh, I don't know, ever since, what, five judges ruled the way they did. I have been so troubled. I have prayed. I have tried to preach the messages God wants me to preach. And every time I step out of this pulpit, I felt this way this morning. I know I feel this way tonight. Every time I step out of the pulpit, I say, Lord, I just wished I could have done better. I just wished I could have said more. I wished I could have done something else. And God always taps me on the shoulder, and He always says, Hey, it's not about you. This is about me. I'm going to take care of this. You just stand up for me. Do what I tell you to, and I'll take care of the rest. Church, that's all we need to do. We just need to stand up and be the church God wants us to be, and God says, I'll take care of the rest. Somebody asked me this morning, and I, I've said this before, and, and this question gets asked to me about once a week. Somebody will say, Preacher, are you worried? Yes, I'm worried. I'm a worrier. 
Bible says we ought not to worry about tomorrow. I worry about tomorrow. I worry about what's going on in the world. I worry about my grandkids. I worry about a lot of things. They said, well, are, are you worried about what's going on in the world? Yes, I'm worried about what's going on. Are, are you worried what might happen to you? And let me tell, tell you the truth. I am not worried about what's going to happen to me. One bit. And that's the truth. Because God says, I am with you always. I will take care of you. He said, it's not by your might, not by your power, not by your strength. Hey, this is all up to me. It's my power. It's my might and my spirit. And folks, I'm here to tell you tonight, reason I'm not worried it's because my God's got all power, my God's got all spirit, and my God's got all might. And he says, I have not given you the spirit of fear. And if you've got the spirit of fear, then you need to have a little bit more awe of who I am. And that's what I want to have. I want to have an awe of who God is. You know what my prayer's been for the past three or four weeks? My prayer has been, and, I, and you, you may think this is funny. You may say, well, pro, preacher, that's silly. Prayer has been that I would feel God's presence so powerful and so strongly that I'd just feel like I'd have to take off my shoes because I'm on holy ground, standing in His presence. And I'm not there yet, but that's my prayer of where God will bring me. Church, we need to be drawn closer to God than we've ever been before. Father, draw us by your sweet, sweet spirit on the holy ground into your presence so close to you spiritually that, Father, we might feel and say what Tom and Tara were singing about this morning. Be drawn in such a relationship with Jesus that we would just say, oh gosh, I've just seen Jesus. I've just been with Jesus and it's been so good. Father, touch our church. Bring a spiritual renewal, revival to our church and let it begin with me. And I just pray something would happen in Highland Park Baptist Church that would be so great, so powerful, so wonderful that these four walls could not contain it. Cynthia has this labor of love on fire, and, it's, and, and, and Father, it's, it, it's something that has the potential to reach outside the four walls of this church, but it's going to take more than just one organization, one group of people. It's going to take the body of Christ with a labor of love to reach a lost and dying world for Jesus. Father, I just pray set our souls on fire tonight for you. If there's one here tonight that's lost, I pray tonight they'd be saved. If there's someone who needs to join our church, I pray they'd come. But my prayer is for revival to come, for a spiritual awakening to come, for a recommitment of God's people, a desire to be close to Jesus, to begin to happen in each and every one of our lives tonight. Challenge us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.